Well, hello everyone, and welcome to what is a drizzly and wet Sabi Sands this morning. And the rain's just started coming down now, so hence the timing. You get to see me don this wonderful poncho that's going to protect me from the elements. Some of you may think I'm trying to make a fashion statement, but I'm not. I don't have the taste to buy such wonderful garments. Now, apologies. We are on the rust bucket, which is not really fitted out, so we don't have the proper light. So I'm just going to wedge my flashlight in there. That seems to work. Now you can see me. My name is Scott, everyone, and I'm teamed up with Tebs on camera. You've joined a live safari, so that's why it appears like we are hugely disorganized, I guess, but that is the joy about being involved in these live safaris. You get to see everything along the way. Oh, the poncho, I've closed the poncho and the door sits so right in it. The moving, there you go. Not my most glamorous start to a safari, but now we can go. It's about 20 degrees Celsius in the 70s Fahrenheit. And like I said, it's just started drizzling quite heavily as I jumped out to put the poncho on, it stopped. But at least now we're ready for another little deluge. I'm not expecting any massive downpours, but it's better to be ready for the rain. Now, sadly, a lot of you were eagerly anticipating meeting Neil, who was gonna be doing an interview drive this morning, and you wouldn't believe it as he reversed out of the parking garages, the clutch cable broke on his vehicle. So rather than rushing him onto this vehicle in a panic to send him out alone, they're gonna try and get that vehicle up and running. And we're just gonna wait a few minutes and see what Brent manages to help sort out with Neil. And what may end up happening is we may swap vehicles. He may jump in here and take you on a bit of a drive and I may then take a bushwalk. So that is the one possibility, but we're gonna leave the other guys to troubleshoot. But while it's dark, nobody's gonna be walking around in this wilderness area as it's a death sentence to walk around in the dark. You wouldn't wanna go on a nocturnal walking safari, so definitely safe in the vehicle in the darker hours. I'm hoping that we may find some sign of the Inkahuma pride of lion, which is a pride of lion that were not too far west from our northwestern boundary. They were busy finishing off a buffalo kill yesterday afternoon, and there is a chance they're going to have moved further east back onto Juma. So I'm going to go and check that northwestern corner now. Hopefully we'll have some luck, and wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice if we find these lions for Neil and then send them in with the vehicle. Now for those of you who don't know, Neil, he works in the area, he's been in the industry for many, many years, and I'm sure he's gonna have a lot of interesting things to tell you. And always nice for you guys to get to meet someone new and hear some different stories and have a different take on safari, which is what every safari guide, I guess, will bring to the table, a slightly different energy and interest and passion. If any of you are watching for the first time, you can send through questions using, using the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter and or sending an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. So that's the way you communicate with us and we do love to hear from you. When you are chatting with us, please let us know where you're from. Also, if you can somehow let us know your gender, that also can be quite useful. Sometimes I've answered many, many questions from some of you and I don't even know whether you're a male or a female. So let us know that information. It's always nice to get to know you guys. And that way we can just build on the safari experience and essentially tailor make it for your specific needs. to Liz in Wisconsin and 
It's not always this dark. I mean, it's this overcast morning that's causing it to be slightly darker than normal. But every single morning that we go forward, we're going closer to our winter, and therefore the sun is rising that much later. So as of the 1st of February, we are only going to be heading out at 5.30. So half an hour later, we're currently heading out at 0500 Central African time. So I think the 1st of February is in about a week or so. I'm not too sure what the date is. But whenever that day comes along, you guys can expect to see us starting half an hour later in the morning. The sunset safari will not change uh, times for now, but we'll keep you updated as to when to expect the changes for the sunset safari. Now it's quite fun actually coming out in the morning with the spotlights, even though it's not regular safari kind of protocol, you usually don't drive around in the dark in the morning. But I've quite enjoyed doing it, it's a bit more of a sense of adventure. I always like being out for the sunrise, that's, that's, that's kind of what you aim for on safari usually. Good. Come on animals. Morning X-Ranga, sorry I was just repositioning the radio antenna so that I can help hear a little bit more clearly as we get further and further away from the final control room where Kirsty is directing the show with Nikki lending her hand. And yes, ex Ranga, we are lucky that the rust bucket, which is the vehicle that I'm in today, decided to start. Otherwise, we would have been certainly delayed. We would have been able to make a plan. We would have been able to get that bushwalk backpack up and, up and going. But then our problem would have been the fact that it is as dark as it is now and I would not want to be walking around right now. As I said earlier, Tim in Arkansas, you've asked where the red jack is on Rusty, and it's right here, but it's just been camouflaged by Brent's wonderful spray painting. Well, not that wonderful as you can see, because once you take a closer look, you can see that it is still red. So Brent did some fairly sloppy paint work there, I think, but it concealed it enough to fool you, Tim, and at a glance, it <laughs> is less intrusive than it was before and blends in a little bit better with the bull bar of the vehicle. Now, it's just going to be a moment where I'm probably not going to have... Oh, actually, let me just try and put this antenna up. I haven't been in this vehicle for quite some time, so I don't know its intricacies. Interestingly, all the vehicles are slightly different. Um, this one doesn't appear to be working too well at the moment, so I've been lucky to not have to deal with it. Um, I'm just going to see if putting this antenna up doesn't help my comms with the final control, because if not, we're going to have to turn around and head towards the area where I will not be able to check for lines. So let's see if that helps, and that way we'll be able to continue with our plan. We'll take off this ridiculous poncho now, because it inhibits one's movements greatly. There we go. Uh, well, at least the rain stopped. That's a. Uh, blessing in disguise well not a blessing in disguise it's a blessing for us not a blessing for the environment because we are in a drought it is exceptionally dry at the moment and let's hope now that this antenna is up i can hear what's going on yeah that's working much better very good
see in South Bend, Indiana. Thank you very much for informing us that the 1st of February is on the coming Monday. Now the next thing you can do, Susie, is help me with what day of the week it is today. And then I'll know exactly when to expect the time change. Uh, it's Thursday today, so a couple more days. Thanks, Susie. And you're right, shame poor old Neil. He was obviously so excited to, to head out, which he still will be. Um, maybe he's breathing a sigh of relief. It's incredibly nerve-wracking. Um, and as some of you may have seen yesterday with my friend Brett, he started off like a deer in the headlights, but as the drive proceeded, I thought he became incredibly comfortable and ended up doing a great job. So it takes a little bit of getting used to. So I urge you all to just be your usual friendly selves and it really does help just ease the guys into this fairly daunting task at the outset. So after a while then it just becomes great fun as you all know. to Cheshire Hill. And you're interested to know which animal is most feared when walking in the dark. And it's one that will vary depending on which guide you're asking. And even during the daytime, you'll ask various guides which animal are you uh, most worried about encountering on foot. And some people will say elephants, some will say buffalo, others will say lion, some will say hippo. Um, for me, uh, it's the predators in general that I'd be more cautious of at night. During the day, uh, your chances of a predator seeing you as a food source or, or, or taking a chance is, is very, very uh, slim. Whereas at night, that will change greatly because they feel more comfortable with the cover of darkness. There's no two ways about that. So your chances are, are, are increased greatly at night with predators and probably remain the same with all of the herbivores. And those are my major concerns walking around here during the daytime. It's not bumping into the lions and the leopards that concerns me. It's the hippo and the elephants and the buffalo that are my main concerns. Um, in this reserve, we only really see white rhinoceros, um, which are fairly relaxed animals. They, 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 can be, they can be deadly, they can charge, they are massive, and they've got a very sharp nose with a horn sticking out the end of it. Well, that is the sharp nose, I guess. Um, but not nearly as cantankerous and short-tempered as black rhinoceros, which we do not see regularly here in the Sabi Sands. So. Because of the fact that we are in a predominantly white rhino area, that means, excuse me, uh, the rhino don't seem to cause too much trouble for us when walking. Excuse me, got the sneezes there. Maybe, hopefully, there's a cat nearby. I've developed over the years an uh, allergy to cats. And it's quite frustrating because I love cats, but... I just simply can't cuddle them and snuggle with them, which in this area is not a problem because we don't snuggle and cuddle with the cats of the Saudi Sands. The head of Impala up ahead, so I'm just gonna dim the lights so, so that we don't put our very, very bright lights into their eyes, thus blinding them. to Jay in Las Vegas and you would like to know if there are any bats that fly around here at night and yes there certainly are it's mainly insect eating bats Jay um, that we see and obviously it's very very difficult to film them without you guys getting seasick so I'm just trying to turn off Tim's head now 
So mainly uh, insect eating bats, and I'm not too sure on the exact species for you, sadly. Um, so I can't help you there. But I do know that nearby in the uh, rest camp in the Kruger National Park called Skakuza, you get to see a whole bunch of fruit bats hanging under one of the thatch roofs where you eat uh, at one of the kind of cafes there. And that's called an epauletted fruit bat. Good. Let's take a moment to just to stop and listen and watch this bachelor herd of impala. And not easy business for Tibbs to control the camera. He's got a black refuse bag wrapped around it as a rain cover. Um, it's actually worth probably taking a look at. Um, so what I've done is I've turned the um, my phone around onto selfie mode and as Teb zooms in you'll see him hidden behind his weapon of mass destruction as camera and there's the little black refuse bag there I am as you can see so that's also what the noise may be on the microphone that you may hear but he's doing his best and obviously it's important that we keep the equipment as dry as possible so that we can continue taking you guys on safari on a daily basis. Certainly no tracks of these lions coming back, at least not that I've seen. There is a chance that I may have missed them. in Florida. Are you interested to know how much rain will be required in order to get the riverbeds or sometimes what we call drainage lines here, which could be a little bit confusing, uh, to, to be flowing again. And Mike, sadly, um, due to the effects of the humans outside of this reserve, there's not nearly as much water flowing through here as there used to be. And that's basically the world over. Um, as soon as uh, people start building dams for catchments to kind of feed a city, so you've got a big reservoir of water, that's preventing water flowing down to where it originally would have. And like I said, the world over, there have been massive dams built, farmers sucking up water out of rivers in order to water their maize or their cabbages or their potatoes or whatever it is that they're farming and of course this is a requirement for the huge demands and consumption of a rapidly expanding population on our planet and this obviously has knock-on effects and a lot of the time you don't kind of realize that as we eat on our tasty green apples um, but that is the reality surrounding us even though we've got a beautiful chunk of wilderness and a massive chunk of wilderness, the majority of South Africa is not that. And there are cities and farms and water is obstructed getting to where it ordinarily would have. So the, the riverbeds will never flow as they once did. And the only time that they will flow is after rains for possibly a day or two, maybe three, depending on the, on the individual riverbed and where the rain fell. Um, and then it'll subside. So, look, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it's all doom and gloom. Um, and you may find that these riverbeds, even hundreds of years ago, before uh, human inhabitation, were acting as kind of nature's gutters. So just like we've got gutters on our roofs to help channel water off in a certain direction. Some of the riverbeds that are predominantly dry in this area would have mainly been dry, you know, for a lot of the year. But I can assure you that they would have flowed for far longer periods of time than they do today. And that is because of the knock-on effects of areas outside of the reserve impacting them. The Sabi River and the Sand River both are the two rivers that both flow through the Sabi Sands. Both flow through human inhabitation before they reach us. So those are the things you need to remember. And I guess you could Google Earth, an image of a map of the Sabi Sands, and therefore be able to look 
at what surrounds us, and there is a lot of human inhabitation around us, right up to the fence of the Sabi Sands. In the southern Sabi Sands, where I've worked before, you've got maize crops growing literally up to the fence of the Sabi Sands. Imagine the torture that must be for the elephants, just looking through at these tasty treats. Also, the cows walking along the fence line must be torture for the lions. But those are the realities of of this area and of a lot of parts of Africa. Nancy in Texas and you'd like to know where is the quarantine young male leopard or well, he's not that young anymore that I just said young male leopard because of default but he's I think just over three years of age now so I should probably stop referring to him as young because he's turning into a big boy now and Nancy sadly I don't have the faintest idea where he is um, I'm not too sure when last you've seen, um, but in general he's heading, heading uh, or sticking around to the south and east of, of, of Juma on Torchwood and Cheetah Plains and the coral properties that are outside our area of Traverse. So sadly we cannot go in the, into those areas to hunt him down for you. But he does come back and visit occasionally. We were very lucky to have him kind of mid-December. He killed an adult female kudu um, on our southeastern corner of the property on Ledwood Road. So... Who knows, maybe he'll come back for a visit, but it's not uncommon for young male leopards once they've moved out of their natal area to kind of keep away and actually head further and further afield and that's exactly what mother nature wants to happen because then there's decreased chance of those leopards mating with their mother and or their sisters from previous litters they've kind of step well, half not step sisters but possibly half sisters um, and that'll obviously create better genetic variants so what will usually happen is that the young males will drift off quite far away, whereas female leopards will quite often squeeze in to trade territory, if possible, next to their mother. And that's exactly what's happened here. This is the area of the female leopard called Karula, and her daughter Shadow is literally bordering her territory to the west on Arethusa. And they will compete with one another, which is really interesting. Mother and daughter will often vie for territory. This is the buffer zone of that specific territory. Karula usually hangs out to the left of this road and quite far further east as a general rule. And Shadow sticks around up to this buffer and then further west, all the way to the western boundary of Arethusa. Well, some zebra ahead of us. That's why I just gave off the zebra yodel to greet them. Looking a little bit worked up, which is exciting me. There won't be a good reason why they worked up. Maybe there's some predators nearby. to Justin in New York and very happy to hear that you've been loving these live safaris since you first joined us during Big Cat Week at the end of November, beginning of December last year. Here are the zebra. Like I said, they are feeling a little bit worked up. Justin, you ask a good question and you are interested to know if you are in the unfortunate situation of being caught out in the African wilderness after dark without a flashlight, without fire, where's the safest place to be? And you have hit the nail on the head. You've chosen the perfect spot here. The zebra popping out again. Up in a big tree. 
That's what I would do. And that's exactly what Harry Walleter, one of the old wardens of the Sabu Sands, grandfather of quite a well-known wildlife filmmaker today called Kim Walleter. Now, Harry Walleter was a tough man. And it was in, I think, the early kind of 1900s that Harry was one of the wardens in the Kruger National Park. And back then, they used to do all of their patrols on horseback. I mean, can you imagine? This place was wild, wild, deep, dark, remote Africa. And these guys were covering huge distances, patrolling on horseback, doing their bit being a warden. And I'm not sure which part of the Sabi Sands he was in when he was being a warden. Anyway, he was attacked by a lion while on horseback and the horse managed to escape but he didn't so the lion obviously took him off the back of the horse the horse ran home now this was a huge blessing in disguise and had the horse also been caught by the lion this would have been a problem because as soon as uh, harry walletter's colleagues and work staff realized that the horse had returned home without the rider there was a big problem now they had huge distances to cover and try and backtrack this horse until they eventually found Harry Walleter the following day, tied up with a belt, his belt in a tree, and he had lost a lot of blood by then. The lion had gored him, but you wouldn't believe it. He had managed to kill the lion with a knife, a pen knife with a six inch blade. And I've seen that knife. The blade is about this long and not very big. It's in a museum in the Kruger National Park, along with the skin of that lion. And you can see the puncture wounds where he repeatedly stabbed this big male lion until it eventually let up. And that way he then could crawl himself, kind of pull himself up a tree, one last ditch of trying to save his life. And then he knew he was gonna pass out. So he undid his belt, bolted himself up into the tree so that he couldn't fall out. And that's where they found him, passed out unconscious, but they managed to, to revive him, and he survived, to tell the tale. So that's what he did overnight. He climbed up into a tree, and even, even with wounds, even with blood in the air, you could may well have found that a few hyena came sniffing up to the base of the tree, but were incapable of climbing it. The chance of being plucked out of a tree by a leopard at night is very slim, but possible. That's your only kind of major risk um, by going up a tree. But it's, for me, definitely, excuse me, definitely the safest place um, that, that you could be if you don't have a fire or if you don't have light. If you've got a very bright light, that will help you greatly at night. So that's also important to remember. I don't want it to strike massive fear into you in case some of you are stuck in that unfortunate situation. And it is a reality. You could be out on a night drive in a remote concession in Africa and areas where I've worked where I know the radios aren't as good as they should be and out of the vehicles and you're traversing massive expanses and your vehicle could break and your radio could break and you could be left with the flashlights and your guide may say come we are going to walk home um, and with the bright flashlights in a fairly open area you know it's something that I would do in very specific circumstances so there's always uh, an exception to the rule is what I'm trying to say, and you do have to, I guess, be prepared for just about anything out here. These are the boys that I don't want to encounter. You guys and your short tempers are a problem. Not only have they got short tempers and can they move incredibly quickly and they've got those powerful four quarters and massive horns that can create massive will inflict massive damage very quickly. They are also incredibly tough to stop. And even if you are carrying a massive caliber rifle while you are on a walking safari, unless your bullet is perfectly placed into the brain, they will keep coming without even breaking stride. And these rifles, like I say, have got massive calibers. They've got huge stopping power, but these animals, along with others, like the elephants, are very tricky to bring down. And you hear horror stories of guides in various areas firing five or six or seven rounds into an animal. And even then, it doesn't stop them. But thankfully, 
that doesn't happen very often. And I've been very fortunate in that I've never been in a situation where I have had to shoot an animal and all guides will try their very best to avoid that at all costs. But even the best guide in the world could get unlucky and may have to perform that uh, at, at some stage. Let's take a look at this guy that's just crossed the road. He's got an interesting left eyeball. And that does not look like fun. Shame. I recognize him. And I wonder what caused that. Possibly a branch has popped into his eye. Who knows, but he's clearly not comfortable with that. But he's been around for quite some time since that's happened, or at least since we've been noticing. boys to chew the cud. Well, now a lot of you are going to be very happy with the plan that is being made regarding Neil. He's going to be doing his interview drive in the next short while, so just be patient. And the reason why things are, are getting exciting is that Stefan is going to be taking a bushwalk. And it's been quite a while since I think he's led one. And as many of you may know, he's incredible to go on a bushwalk with. His knowledge is really in depth, as is his passion for being on foot. But quite often he's behind the scenes and not in front of the camera, but you're in luck today. So Steph's gonna be taking the bushwalk and then I'm gonna swap out with Neil, who's gonna take over commanding the steering of the rust bucket, which is this vehicle that we're in now. Very, very happy that that drizzle stopped. It really started coming down quite hard just before we went live. That's why you caught me mid-poncho. So I'm happy that that's not gonna further complicate Neil's morning. The poor guy, he must have thought, this isn't a good start, they're gonna, I can't even get the car to go forward, but obviously that had absolutely nothing to do with him. Just uncanny timing that the clutch cable snapped as it was his turn to get moving. I think at least he's got, I guess, the bad luck out the way. Kathy in Tennessee and you're interested to know the kind of protocols that will will be used when trying to reintroduce an animal into a wilderness area and will they be kept in a quarantine area will they be taken back to their natal area it's a it's a very very complicated question that you ask that will vary for a number of, of reasons and i'll list these reasons just so that everyone understands why it would be impossible for me to answer your question accurately without knowing more information what kind of animal is it was that animal born in the wild or was it born in captivity that is being reintroduced into the wild was it fully grown when it was taken out of the wild before being in quarantine, therefore knowing how to survive in the wild before being taken, or was it young and not aware of the complications of living in the wild before being reintroduced into the wild. So those are the, the, the main issues that I'll need to know more about before being able to attempt to try and answer the question in more depth. But even then, I'm no game capture expert and or quarantine rehabilita rehabilitation and reintroduction specialist. So, and even then, you will find specialists that will have varying degrees. That's, that, that uh, I think that's an avenue uh, and an area that is not uh, a, a, a pure science and there's going to be various uh, very different views on what is the right thing to do with regards to that. I think that should kind of 
I, I hope that makes sense, Kathleen. I, I wish I could give you more, but like I say, there's, there's simply far too many variables for me to be able to accurately give you uh, an educated answer. I've got an idea though of what you think. I've got an idea of what you're thinking of though, Kathy, and sadly we've got no no news on that matter. And like I said, trust me, we, we, we don't want to hide anything from you. And as soon as we hear anything about a possible animal that may be coming back, we will be sure to let you know. We are all in the same boat, Joe. to Whitney and you would like to know is it more dangerous to be on a horseback safari as opposed to be on a walking safari and my f my first uh, kind of spur of the moment answer will be it's more dangerous on foot but then once we unpack things a little bit more again it'll depend on a, a few uh, a few scenarios are you a good horse rider or not um, if you do not know how to ride a horse, you will be safer on your own two feet. Uh, but if you are a horse rider, it will be, I think, definitely safer on a horse. Again, provided that that horse is relatively well trained and used to being in, uh, in a wild area, being exposed to wild animals. And I have worked in areas where they do offer horseback safaris where the horses, you train them to know what a lion is and you walk the horses up to lion, just as you would approach lion on foot on a walking safari. Now, um, because you're on a big animal and you're elevated and you're still a human and lions can still see that you're a human and you still have human intellect to kind of out-compete or, or, or out-move the lion's thought process, you will you will be in a safe position being on a horse. I think safer position being on a horse than being on foot because you're bigger and therefore that much more of a reason why the lion should not approach you or not want to jump on you. Um, so you're essentially standing up on a pedestal, which is the horse. Um, again, though, if that horse doesn't listen to your commands, which in turn will the, you put you in a situation where the lion is no, you are no longer mentally out competing the lion. You run away from the lion. What do cats do? They chase things. A little ball of fur, a human riding a horse's back. The, the chase mechanism is triggered only when something runs away. And often, and quite interestingly enough, even in the wild, if a leopard runs up to a warthog and the warthog doesn't know that it's there and it stands its ground continuing to eat, facing the opposite direction, the leopard will probably jam on brakes and not latch onto that warthog. And there are actually clips of that happening with young leopard that stalk up to a, a young leopard stalking up to a warthog. It takes three steps and pounces, lands right behind the warthog who continues to eat. And the leopard just kind of sits there not knowing what to do Le the warthog turns around, sees it, and then runs off. And then the leopard's kind of, you know. So that gives you an idea of how things vary uh, on, on, on the situations. But I think it's definitely safer to be on a horse if you know how to ride it and if the horses are fairly well trained. So something definitely worth looking into if you do like riding horses because it's great, great fun. And you get to gallop alongside wildebeest and the giraffe. And you can approach animals like elephant quite close. Uh, something that I would love to do and I am going to have to do fairly soon. Nikki, my girlfriend, uh, is who's sitting in the final control, is a horse riding fanatic and obviously she loves the bush as well. So to combine the two is something that I need to make happen soon. And I think the place where I'm going to do that is Kenya. I've got some great friends up there with horse riding outfits that I'm really looking forward to making the most of. Now, while I've been yabbering away, the sun has just broken through the clouds. And look at this beautiful scene. And I've just heard Nikki shouting for joy and final control. So now you are all witnesses to the fact that I have to take her on this horseback safari. There's no, no, no way I can get out of it now. Far too many people are involved. Isn't this a magical scene? 
and very happy that there's a small little gap in the horizon because it's basically eight eighths cloud cover, maybe seven eighths. But I think that we may get lucky and this, these clouds may burn off. Um, as Teb zooms out, you'll see there's a few kind of light patches within this predominantly cloudy sky. And I think there's blue skies beyond that. So, well, there definitely is. We all know that. It's just how far beyond the clouds. But I think there's a chance that things are going to clear up. So, looks like we're going to have a beautiful day here in the Sabi Sands of South Africa. have been evading us the last few days good morning my wife. and that's something that we need to try and rectify but i've just got a message through saying that i need to rush across to the drc which is the juma research camp which is where the majority of the safari live crew stay Basically, what is going to have to happen is once we get into that area, we're going to have to just stop the safari for maybe five or ten, ten minutes at the most in all likelihood. Um, and the reason why is that the vehicle on this camera, which is known as the pea shooter, is the bushwalk camera. So we're going to need to take this camera off, put the other camera on here, um, as well as the other present to Neil, get him all comfortable with the vehicle, and he's going to continue driving while Steph leads a bushwalk. So exciting stuff, and again, isn't it wonderful that you guys are a part of every step of our journey? And for me, I almost get excited when things don't work out, because it's nice to just see things differently, and it often leads to, you know, things like this happening with Steph taking out on a bushwalk, and... That wasn't the plan for today, but now it is, and everything happens for a reason. And I love the fact that you guys are in on all of the little shenanigans in between. I'll be back at the DRC in about five minutes, if we continue at this leisurely speed. Now, Kara, you've mentioned that you would like to see the swap outs. We'll try and show you as much as possible as soon as the camera... Ca I mean, you'll be able to see us arriving at the Juma Research Camp, so that we'll be able to show you. We'll be able to show you the, the garages where the vehicles are parked. So I'm sure Steph's going to be standing around, Neil's going to be standing around, so we'll give you a little glimpse of that, but then we want to try and make it as quick as possible. So then we'll cut the, cut the power and get moving so the safari can continue basically now though unless we see a dinosaur or something spectacular happening i'm just going to keep heading back to the camp i don't want to prevent neil from getting as much time behind the wheel as possible Siberia Zumi, you would like to know if we've got any geckos that run in and around the camp. And yes, we do. And I've got a wonderful photograph of one that I'll be sure to upload onto my Instagram account straight after drive, which will be right now, and that way you'll be able to have a look at it. Um, so there's a few different types of geckos, and I'll let you know a little bit more about the different types and the ones that we see. But they've got incredibly thick tails, they're quite big, chunky geckos. And what's been wonderful is actually noticing that there's a few little hatchlings that are appearing. Um, Nikki and my room seems to be a gecko haven. So it's been fun seeing all the tiny new additions popping out in all corners of the room. Just gotta hope that they don't attract any more snakes. 
Mama Z, the lady who helps keep our keep us in check and with all of our housekeeping, etc. She found a puff adder in the cupboard Nick in my room just as we went to leave as she was digging through there for some linen. And that's one of the last snakes that you want to be bitten by. Terribly, terribly cytotoxic venom that causes your flesh to basically melt off the bone and quite often leads to an amputation of some sort, if bitten. So yes, I bear assuming there are some geckos around and I'll make sure that I post a picture for you guys to have a look at. Jigger, the other vehicle, who I think it's just the clutch cable that's gone. Maybe the whole clutch has exploded. That will be a problem. Then we've only got one vehicle. Hello again, Nancy in Texas. And you're interested to know a little bit about habituation. And it's important for everyone to understand that the animals in the Saudi sands have all been habituated over many, many years. No, hang on, they haven't all been habituated. Many of them have been habituated. But there are certain individuals like the genets and the aardvark and the porcupine that even though they've lived here for many, many years and been born here and raised here, because people haven't specifically focused on them as a species, we haven't got them habituated. Therefore, if you see them at night with the spotlights or whenever you may see them, they're not gonna be nearly as relaxed with us as an animal like the leopard, for example. And Nancy's wanting to know which is the most difficult animal to habituate. Well, in terms of general kind of big game that you would view in an, uh, 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 an area like this, uh, I would say the leopard. And that's why it's important just to distinguish high profile game, animals that people want to see, as opposed to the other random little animals like gen genet and aardvark that people are, they want to see, but less, there's less pressure to see them. Um, so for your big game, the leopard is by far the hardest to habituate to. And that is what makes the Saudi Sands the wonderful reserve that it is, because we've got such incredible leopard viewing. And that's coupled with the fact that, A, they are habituated, therefore they don't run away from the vehicles or hide from the vehicles or completely avoid being seen by the vehicles, which is how most leopards will react unless huge amounts of time has been spent winning them over. And I'm talking many, many years. This has been operating as a wildlife photographic destination for close to 60 years, many, many years ago. Um, huge time was spent habituating the animals. And I don't know exactly what happened because I wasn't sure, but I wouldn't be hugely surprised if Impala were shot and hung up in trees to bait leopard. And by baiting a leopard to that tree, you can park the vehicle over here far away and even get out the vehicle and jump into another vehicle, drive off and leave the vehicle here so that just just the vehicle alone, even without a human in it, will make that leopard relaxed with the vehicle. Then maybe again, far away from that tree where the, the impala is dangling, luring, luring the leopard in, you sit in the vehicle and slowly talk. And over many, many years and a long time, that's how leopards were habituated. And it's no different to gorillas that were habituated, chimpanzees that were habituated, that are now no longer fed by humans but were, for a period of their life, baited by humans, won over that trust, and then slowly the humans extracted. Now, obviously, that's contravening a major rule. Do not feed the animals. Um, but it, it, it is one method of habituating animals that obviously isn't spoken of that much and isn't required in many areas anymore. And that's good, because it's a very, very fine line between right and wrong. Um, and if not done prop properly, you can result in 
that animal's life being at, at, at risk. Because if you make that animal realize that you as a human are providing it with a meal, when you don't provide it with a meal, it may become angry with you. And you don't want any of the animals becoming angry with you. So that is why you do not feed the animals, and that is why it's a kind of tricky thing. But leopards are the most difficult animals to habituate. That is why you'll get some reserves in Africa where you do have leopards, you just don't see them. Whereas lion and buffalo and elephant, they're a little bit more welcoming to us as humans. All right. Nearly back. the Ferrari Safari technique, but there's a good reason to today. One thing that I should have just finished off on habituation is that once you've got adults, even one adult female leopard, once you've got her habituated, just one, over time, by spending time with her, she's going to give birth to cubs. And then those cubs are going to read off and feed off her behavior, which is relaxed to the vehicle. And therefore, from a very young age, they are going to become even more relaxed with the vehicle. And so the story continues. And their cubs and future offspring, I mean, there's just a massive ripple effect of more and more leopards being used to the vehicles and used to us as humans. So... Once the code is initially cracked with an adult or a herd of adults, all of their offspring will continue to act in a similar light, provided we as humans continue to behave the same way. So that's why the great thing is, is once you have cracked that code, like I say, maybe doing some things that may be a little bit controversial, um, you can win the animals over, and it's important to habituate them. So this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Look at this crew waiting in expectance for you. Addie Rogers. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask him, just to pass to the, the garage, that's where the vehicles sleep at night. And can you believe it? There's an Inyala feeding right there, in and amongst us. Isn't that awesome? You can't see its head, but that's going to be the kind of missing mystery from this morning's drive. And we're going to call it off. You're going to be gone for five or ten minutes while we switch, switch cameras around, and then you're going to be on a bushwalk with Steph and on Drive with Neil. You're going to have a great time, and I'll see you all next time. Toodle-doo. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Good morning everybody, uh, we've had a little technical issue with the other vehicle so Scott has kindly driven back and lent me his vehicle and Steph is out on walk. So my name is Neil, I'm here for the morning trying out for another presenter position with, uh, with Wild Earth. Looking forward to it, uh, I'm a little bit nervous but uh, we're going to go out and hopefully just enjoy ourselves and have some fun. Um, it's a really interesting opportunity for myself being here. It's uh, something I've wanted to be doing for a while and I'm also a very avid watcher of Wild Earth. Uh, even working in the bush as I do at the moment, this is a, an incredible opportunity to work, uh, work with the team and the very, very knowledgeable people that are here. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and I hope I can keep the level of guiding and knowledge up there with the, with the rest of the guys. So if you have any questions, if you have any questions and want to know anything about me, please send them through. I will try and answer any questions as best as possible. Jenny on Twitter has a, a quick question. She asking how much training I've done uh, before I've come through for this position. Jenny, I started in the bush nearly 15 years ago. So I did a, a guiding course. I did a two-year guiding course, um, which took me up to the level two standard of guides in, in Southern Africa. Um, I then worked as a, a professional guide for nearly six years in Zuland, which is 
south of where we are currently. Um, after, after I'd done guiding, I moved on to farm management um, and reserve and wildlife management and to poaching as well. And I spent quite a number of years doing that. Uh, it, spent, it, it gave me a really nice opportunity to understand how the entire system works, the entire ecology of areas, which was very, very interesting. But I found that I really missed taking people out into the bush and showing them what was out there, exploring what was out there with people. So I got involved with volunteers more than guests. Um, volunteers coming through from all over the globe. Literally, I've had volunteers from everywhere. Gave me an opportunity to both work in management and research and to still have people out in the bush with me for extended periods of time. Uh, the longest volunteer I ever had was for five months and uh, it's a great opportunity to really get involved with the bush and make a difference to, to different aspects that are out there. So I spent a long time doing that, uh, particularly in Namibia, working with human and wildlife mitigation. It was very, very interesting in the Caprivi with predators and in the Kanani region with elephants, uh, with the actual desert elephants, which was an amazing experience. And then I've been working in this area where we are currently. Um, I've been working a little bit closer to the Timbavati region, and I've been working up there for two and a half years, uh, managing and looking after a property for a conservation area up there. So in total I've spent 15 years in the bush and two years of study, but in the bush you never stop studying. There is every single day there is something out here that is new, that is interesting, uh, that you can, you can never come out here and say you know it all. There's every single day there will be something new. Um, so you never stop studying as a guide. if there's such a thing as the ugly five there is indeed an ugly five they are deemed to be the non prettiest animals in the bush um, I don't quite believe that personally I think every animal out here is an amazing unique animal uh, we have a number of different uh, fives in, in southern Africa we have the, the big five obviously that everybody knows uh, the ugly five we also have the small five as well. So we have a number of different species which are, are utilized for um, not quite different marketing strategies, but they're different classifications in the bush for, for different groups of animals. Uh, the ugly five includes members like the warthog and the marabou stork. They're all really beautiful animals. And I, I, yeah, I don't really like the ugly five. It's a uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. Every animal out here is a beautiful animal. Sherry from Los Angeles, a uh, lovely question, has asked how I how I know Breton and Scott uh, and the rest of the team. I was very fortunate to go to the same senior school as, as Brent at the time. Uh, Scott came a little bit after me. Um, I'd left, left school already and was working in the bush by the time that Scott was there. But uh, I've known Brent since, since school and it's been, uh, been a good journey along the way. We've always kept in contact, uh, being spread around Africa at different times, but we've always kept contact with each other. And uh, when Brent joined Wild Earth, he told me about it, and I've always been interested in it since uh, since Brent told me about it. And Scott, I know more from watching him on on Wild Earth. Uh, 
learning quite a bit from him. His knowledge is phenomenal. So it's it's been really interesting for me, even as a guide, to watch watch the guys out in the bush and present. Uh, it offers a very different perspective um, from different areas. Each area in Southern Africa has different and unique, even areas that are only 20, 30 kilometers apart. You've got different habitats, different species that occur, different birds that dominate areas. And I've had a lot of fun watching the team, in particular Scott, his knowledge is, is phenomenal. Um, so I've borrowed some of his information. Got a beautiful little group of zebra up ahead, a dazzle of zebra. A couple of nice little youngsters in the group. to know why so many zebra have a black circle marking on the inside of their leg. I think we're going to get a gap just here. How's that too? So the, the zebra themselves have very, very unique unique markings. You can see each individual animal has a different, slightly different pattern to each other. And um, these zebra, the plain zebra or the birchal zebra, um, have a very distinctive shadow stripe. You can see that slightly lighter brown stripe in between the black stripes. Now, each individual will be slightly striped differently. So you can use them for identifying features. Obviously, you will find some that are quite similar. But the little black spot you can see just on the inside of the leg there, is actually just on the inside of the knee. And that's often used for different reasons. Um, it actually smells quite strong. Um, it's similar to a scent marking spot, but it's also where the legs rub together, especially when they're sitting. So you get this little mark on the inside of the leg and that's just from that. It's, the, it's like a, a small pad that just keeps the skin from becoming raw and opening a wound on there. Um, so zebra are really, really fun species. In Southern Africa at the moment, we have three different species. We have one extinct species, the quaha. Um, that was unfortunately extinct quite a long time ago. There have been a number of projects to try and rebreed quaha from uh, virtual zebra in particular. And they're a lovely species. Zebra can be very deceiving at the same time. They always, always look very healthy. Um, they have a very, very impressive gut system, which produces a huge amount of gas and flatulence. Um, so they can be a very difficult species to judge on body condition because they do always look fat because of that. So not a great indicator for how well they're doing in the bush uh, at different times of the year, especially during winter. Uh, you need to look at other species for that. But zebra are beautiful. Um, going back to the three different species that we have, obviously the virtual zebra, these ones here. And then we have two different species down in the Cape, the uh, Hartman's Mountain Zebra and uh, the Cape Mountain Zebra. So really, really enjoyable species. Uh, the mountain zebra stripes are much, much closer together and a lot harder to tell the individual animals apart. And there's no shadow, shadow stripe on either of those zebra species. So the Birchels is a very easy one to identify. We're gonna carry on going, see what else we can find. animals are. Uh, hers in particular is the elephant. Uh, 
Janice, I have to admit to being an elephant lover. I have spent a, a huge amount of time with elephants, especially in Namibia. Um, I got very fortunate to work very closely with the desert elephants, uh, very specifically adapted desert elephants up there. Um, so elephants are one of the top on my list. As far as favorite animals go, or a favorite animal, I don't. I don't have a particular favorite. I intensely enjoy the wild dog, leopard, the species that are really elusive most of the time. It gives us, gives a lot of, of the guides a really, really fun, enjoyable time tracking and just finding those animals because they are so rare to see. I do particularly enjoy a couple of smaller species. The pangolin in particular is one of my favorite animals. Um, so no particular favorite animal. I just enjoy the bush in general and really enjoy leopard, wild dogs, and pangolin. Those are my favorite species in the bush. As far as antelope go, my favorite is the Nyala. He's and she are both beautiful, beautiful animals. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with them, especially in Zululand, which is a great area to see them. So, as far as antelope go, and y'all are all my favorite. It's a bit of a belated start to the morning and uh, I just want to say hello basically from uh, from myself Steph Vinterboer and we have Viam on camera on the bushwalk on the sunrise safari. We've decided that we were going to come, oh got some flies buzzing around my head. We've decided this morning that we were going to come and uh, and walk basically in a southerly direction. There's a game path here that neither myself nor Viam have actually walked at all. And so, so far it's been quite surprising. Unsurprising of where it is, I was actually expecting it to be a little bit closer to the drainage line. There in the distance you'll see that there's a quite a deep depression. Now, for those of you who know the property well, this drainage line is where we get our water from. It's where Philemon's Dip is located. And I'm seeing that there's a very healthy seep line system here. Basically what that means is all the rain that falls around this area, it'll come out of the ground here where we are. Uh, we don't have springs in this part of the world, we've got seep lines, but this is where our groundwater comes out and runs then into these drainage lines. And a very good place to find good quality grass and with good quality grass you get good quality grazers and we're hoping to find some lions this morning. Myself and VM have come out wanting to walk into a lion and that's what we, we're doing. So we're basically walking through a supermarket here. That's, uh, that's, that's what we're doing and hoping that we find someone. So we're going to carry on walking here. We're going to weave our way through the trees here. I want to see if I can find something interesting to show you and uh, we'll take it from there, basically. from Illinois has given us our first question this morning and Chuck wants to know he's been watching the show for a bit now and he is wanting to know why he hasn't seen any butterflies or flowers. Uh, Chuck, um, two quite different answers for that really. Chuck, uh, firstly um, flowers are not that common here. It, it, we need a lot of rain um, and then the flowers that we do have here are usually quite small. We don't have these fields of really big flowers. Um, that are lying in blankets. You've got to really stick your nose into some places to get flowers. Um, we start finding a lot of flowers uh, probably about a thousand yards in altitude higher than where we are now is where flowers really start to proliferate. So that's for the flowers part. The butterflies part is because we do these walks so early in the morning and so late in the afternoon. There are a lot of butterflies here but they're really only prevalent around lunchtime. The day heats up the, but the butterflies open up their wings 
they get their metabolic heat from the environment, they start to, to, to warm up and then from there they go and forage for, for, their, um, for their nectar that they love. So you find a lot of, fly, a lot of butterflies here between say 11 o'clock and about 3 o'clock and then from there they start to wane off again. And that's obviously when we're going out on safari. So we, there are some around, we'll see if we can find some. Um, usually hanging around the flowers that we're looking for as well. And we'll try and show you some. We're quickly going to weave our way through here. VM has a fairly large aerial on, the, on his back. Very mobile actually, to be quite honest with you. But nevertheless, he is... He is still subject to bending over. Now, where we're walking now, I'm expecting to find not a lot of insects. The ground here is actually almost sodden with water when it, when it does, when these sea plants are active. This is the first year in 17 of the years I've been in the bush here where the sea plants at this time of the year are not flowing. Um, in a normal year, not even in a high rainfall year, we could have expected where I'm walking at the moment for us to be walking in water. There's should be a lot of water flowing over the ground over here. Not too much of a story, I mean, let me give you an example. This here would be a pool of water. It's now dry. This should be a pool of water. It is now dry. And this is a wallow. This is how pans are formed. So what happened was an elephant came here. He dug out a little bit of a root. An animal then came, an animal like a warthog or a buffalo or rhinoceros came through here and lay inside this and started to pack it out. It would fill in with water and because water is flowing from under the ground here, it would have stayed full, which of course would have been an attraction to animals on a hot summer's day. And from there, they would then have uh, started to plaster it off as their clay and mud on their bodies washes off they almost start to plaster the uh, the sides of these pans and then the pan gets a bit bigger and a bit bigger and a bit bigger and that's how you get natural pans forming inside here so this is sort of like the genesis point for a pan not this year but definitely at some point now I want to have a look at this we started to find these snails just the other day on walk now, if you have a look, this is an empty snail shell. And have a look at the detail in that shell. That's where the snail lived. I'm going to turn it over slowly so that you can see the intricate patterns over there. Have a look at that. And believe it or not, there's actually a mathematical equation that determines why and how many of those rings um, a snail shell has and will also determine how many petals a flower has and a number of other things. It's called harmony mathematics. Quite interesting, yeah. I was expecting this actually to be a different kind of, of snail shell. This is not the one that I was wanting or not the one that I'm, I was hoping to see. And I'm gonna try and see if we can find them for you. It's the first time I've seen the particular snail we're on, on search for while we're looking for these lions. And uh, I'm looking to see if I can repeat the performance. It's an unknown snail to me. And I'm trying to see if we can repeat the habitat where we found them on the walk the other day with Jamie. They were on stumps. And while I look for one of these snails with you, and we've also just heard some impala cavorting across the, the drainage line here, we're going to link you back through to Neil so that you can get a nice idea of what he's up to at the moment. And we will carry on our search down here, catching up with you in a while. everybody. I believe Steph's been showing you some shells of snails that we have out here. I haven't managed to find any beasties yet for, for everybody to have a look at. So just driving around slowly looking for any fresh tracks that might be out here.
Loretta's got a great question. Uh, she's asked if I've had any great encounters in the bush while I've had the opportunity to be working out here. And yes, Debbie, I've had a, a number of absolutely phenomenal experiences which I will never ever forget. Uh, things happen in the bush very quickly sometimes. And sometimes they slightly more planned when we've got an idea of where an animal's moving to. And one in particular that sticks out for me and always, always will stay in, in my mind is in Namibia. I was tracking a herd of desert elephants with a bull that was uh, a big male that was with the group and with the herd. And he was, uh, he's the biggest male in that southern area that I was in. His name was Furtrekker, which uh, in, is an Afrikaans word for the one who leads in front. The one who makes the way, basically. And uh, I had the opportunity to foresee where they were going to move to at night. Uh, they had a, a very specific area that they were going to go to. Uh, obviously, water is very scarce out there, so I knew where they were going to go. So I jumped ahead of them on uh, en route, and uh, I had the opportunity to camp in an area out in the, in the desert, and uh, we set up camp, we knew they were going to come to us, so we set up camp, everybody fell asleep, still no sign of the elephants, and at about one o'clock in the morning, Fortrecker woke me up, and he was only standing less than five meters away from the end of my sleeping bag. I wasn't sleeping in a tent that night. We used to sleep right out under the stars in the desert. And Furtrekker was standing five meters away from me. I was flat prone on the ground and he was staring down at me, really, really giving me an inquisitive look. And he couldn't quite figure out what I was. I presume I must have looked like a worm or, or something like that to him lying on the ground. So he stood there looking at me for a, a good couple of minutes and very slowly he took another step forward and he stretched out his trunk and he actually started smelling my sleeping bag and step, took another step forward and eventually his front feet were on either side of my sleeping bag between my legs with his trunk literally right over the top of my face. And that was an amazing experience. He smelt me, he took his time, he realized I wasn't any threat to him. And he stood right above me looking down at me and then just slowly, elephants have a, a lovely manner in which when they're standing and they want to get moving again, they turn their head to one side and then they move the opposite way. And that's exactly what he did. He just turned around slowly and uh, made his way off. He was quite happy with, uh, with me just being on the ground and not being a threat to him. And that's something I've taken away from that experience is that animals coming into, into my space, I'm quite happy with. But when you start pressurizing an animal, when you push into their space, that's when you really put stress onto animals. And that's something I strive not to do in the bush. I don't like affecting behavior by what I'm doing. Um, and I don't like pushing into their space because as soon as I push into their space, I am putting a little bit of stress on that animal. They might uh, move off, they might change their behavior. So it's something that I try and strive for is to not have a huge influence on what happens out here. I try to be the minimal impact that I can. We are guests in their environment essentially. And that's the biggest experience for me from, from that particular incident is to, to be part of it once you're out here, to be as small and insignificant as possible. There's obviously times when you need to make a difference and times when you need to make a big difference. But the bush in general for me is somewhere where I try and make as small an impact as possible and affect as little as possible.
like to know if there's a big difference between the species of, of game, between the Sabi Sands and Namibia in particular. She she is hoping to visit this year. And it's a great question, Gail. Yes, there is a big difference between the two areas. In fact, it's the two areas that I love in particular. Namibia is an incredibly beautiful yet very harsh landscape. Um, a lot of it is semi-desert or very open areas. So you get different species up there like brown hyena, um, desert adapted elephants, and very, very unique species that we don't get down in the Sabi Sands, your species like springbuck. Um, so yes, you will see a big difference between the, the species. There are some common species between the areas. Um, the Sabi Sands, for you, when you visit, you will find that the density of animals in the Sabi Sands is much higher than Namibia. It has what we call a much higher carrying capacity because of the different uh, different systems. Sorry, I just spotted an elephant back on our left-hand side here. I'm just going to reverse slowly. But yes, you will find a big difference between the two areas. The carrying capacity in this area is much higher, so it can carry a lot more game. Um, and that's based on the different systems that we have in place. So a nice young medium-aged bull that we have feeding on the side of that terrier there. Often, quite often see elephants doing this. Uh, I've seen it a number of times in this area and in, in Kruger National Park as well. Um, the reason why these bulls and sometimes the cows and youngsters will feed near termitaria is the actual termites themselves really, really do a lot of good for the ground. And a lot of the time, your species of grasses and trees around the termitaria are really flourishing. There's a lot of green growth that comes through there. They're very sweet grasses. So you will often see Ellie's doing this, uh, feeding around Termitaria, spending quite a bit of time around them as well. Obviously nice little vantage spots. He can gain a little bit more height. You may have seen that Scott out early this morning, there was a little bit of drizzle around. But you can see this Ellie already flapping his ears. It's warming up very quickly and humidity is probably close on 70 to 80% today. So it is going to warm up very quickly today and this Ellie's already feeling the heat. Those massive ears of his, him flapping like that. An elephant can pass around about 90% of his blood in his body through those ears every five to ten minutes. So it's a very effective way of cooling down his system by doing that. He's really climbing up on top of that now. Obviously wants the really sweet branches from the top of sweet branches from the top of that tree. lovely question is asked how often desert elephants need to drink from my own personal experience I've seen the eddies in that area go for a good three days without drinking uh, they have a, an amazing ability to know where the available water is at different times of the year uh, one of the biggest influences that's actually happening in Namibia at the moment with the desert elephants is the human aspect of what's going on up there and a lot of people are pushing into the ecotone between the arid area and the desert itself a lot of communities have started farms in that area and obviously with along along with the farms they need to produce water for their cattle and goats and cows and their sheep as well so that's where a lot of the conflict in those areas is coming from is the elephants are starting to recognize that there is available water on those farms. He's really climbing right on top at the moment. Uh, very unusual to see him right on the top of it. A uh, lovely view of him. That's really unusual. He is standing on the top of that cemetery now. 
But going back to the desert elephants, that's the conflict that's arising is that available water that the farmers have made, the elephants can smell from a good long distance away. And those ellies are going into the farming areas now and they can recognize that there is water on those farms and that's where the conflict is coming in. Now, when we talk about farms, a lot of people think about a fenced area. In Namibia, in those desert areas, there are no fences. So those desert elephants can walk between the farms without any problem at all. So they walk right into the center of those villages where, where the water is. And that's where the conflict comes in, is the elephants can obviously drink a huge amount of water. And small groups in, of desert elephants, they typically number between eight to 15 individuals. Uh, there's a small herd in that area that only has three individuals in it. But obviously, 10 to 15 individuals all drinking at one time can take up a huge amount of water. And they drink all the water that the farmers have in one go. And obviously the farmers then get upset and they come out and they try and chase the elephants away. And that's where the conflict arises. Um, there's been, unfortunately, there's been a couple of recorded human deaths because of the, the conflict, and that's the main reason that I was in that area. Um, so mitigating the, the conflict between the desert elephants themselves and, and the farmers. And the way we did that was to build a rock boma structure around the water pumps themselves and the pipes um, so that the elephants couldn't damage where they could smell water. Uh, we also had an agreement with the farmers that once we had done that, that they would provide water for the elephants. So we would quite often build small water troughs for the elephants to come and drink from. And that way the elephants could get to water and that the farmers still had all of their structure left behind and that it, nothing was left broken and left them without any water. Um, but to go back to the initial question, desert elef elephants can go a good three days that I've watched personally, and possibly even longer when, they, when they're really pushed. Those elephants can walk through the desert for a good couple of hundred kilometers knowing where the next water source is going to be. research has been put into that and what's happening a lot of the time is young elephants are being pushed out of family herds and, and into different areas. The little boy is on his move now. And what's particularly happening is these young bulls have no big bull to actually teach them how to behave and what to do discipline them when they become too cheeky. I'm just going to move forward slightly so you've got a better view of him. So these young bulls that are coming into areas where there's no big dominant bull, often what happens is they go into, into a time period in their lives called must, and they go through it a number of times a year, and it's a hormonal drive for them that really pushes them to find females but they get very frustrated sexually frustrated during that time period and they seek to really find females but when they don't they start to become very 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 frustrated with life um, they often push down trees and things like that and there's a number of records of, of young bull elephants unfortunately killing both buffalo and rhino because of it. They're looking for something to relieve that sexual frustration on and it turns into aggression. And unfortunately that is something that does happen. 
They can also feel threatened by the bigger herbivores, buffalo and, and in particular rhino as well. And they can just defend their, their own areas and that can be a result unfortunately of that. This young bull's just taking it easy now. He's found a tiny bit of water there, it looks like. Just spraying the sides of his ears. But we're going to send you back to Steph. He's got uh, some giraffe, I believe. So we're going to send you over to him while we spend a bit of time with this young boy and then have a look and see what else we can find. Seems like we're going from one species of animal having breakfast to another species of animal having breakfast. This time we've got some giraffe in the background as you can see over there. Myself and VM decided to come and have a look at what the Impala were making noise for. It just sounded like they were having a big game and we ended up walking into what at the time was something akin to what I've seen in the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. We were just surrounded by animals and you wouldn't believe it but Alongside this female giraffe and her baby, which we're going to take you to have a look at at the moment, there's also some impala, there's two different herds of zebra and there's a big herd of wildebeest as well. They just moved off into the bushes here uh, for a bit, but let's take a walk down this termite mound and let's see if we can get a bit closer to that giraffe mother and, and her calf and then we'll make a bit of a loop around the bush in front of us and see if we can, can show you what we're looking at from the termite mound here in a bit. So come with us. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and um, use as much cover as we can to keep between us and this giraffe. She's, she knows that we're here, she's been watching myself and VM for a bit. Um, and I don't think that she'll move off at a run, but nevertheless, let's use what cover we can. Giraffe are super vigilant. so. And being a mom, she's also going to be even more vigilant as to what's snooping around in the bushes around her. But because she's heard us talking, and because she's actually been watching us, I can actually see her over there. She doesn't even really care. She's, she's busy feeding. And it's not that these animals are tame, for those of you who are watching the show for the first time, these animals are, are absolutely not tame. This is as wild as what you can get in South Africa. We're in the three and a half million odd or 3.9 million odd hectare Greater Kruger National Park. And this animal is as wild as the wild can be. She won't do anything to us. If anything, she'll probably move off. But Hi, Elaine was saying she was watching with uh, the bushwalk the other day with um, with Jamie and noticed that we saw a bunch of tortoises and bugs and beetles and things straight after the rain and Elaine all the way from Michigan good morning Elaine you're wanting to know has the bush dried out it doesn't seem that we're seeing too much of that stuff um Elaine the bush has dried out a little bit, but not enough for those types of animals to actually go away. Um, already this morning, myself and VM have found a tortoise. We found a bunch of bugs um, covered in flies as per usual. And we have these animals that we, we're with at the moment. So it has dried out a bit. There's no standing water at the moment, but not enough for those animals to go back into whatever slumber they were in or whatever stasis they were in. So here we go. I'm not going to face. Ah, oh, this is just too much. 
but they're just going to move off a little bit. They're not too bad. We've actually got three giraffe here, two females and a baby with the older female, this blonde female that we have. Yeah, she's in absolutely beautiful condition. Now you get giraffes that are born blonde. <coughs> you often get blonde giraffe and you often get brunette giraffe and they do get a little bit darker as they get older. Uh, you have a look why I know it's a female without even having picked up my binoculars is I had a look at the tuft of hair at the top of her horns. Female giraffe have horns that are a little bit underdeveloped compared to males. They're a little bit more petite and the hair covering goes all the way to the top almost like a paintbrush. Males have this big bald patch at the top of their horns and that's how I know she's a she. She's a beautiful lady. And I love these. As striking as what dark giraffe are, I'm definitely drawn to the more brunette giraffe. I know it might be sounding a bit weird for, for, for those of you who don't know my sense of humor that well, but I like the, the lighter colored giraffe. They, for some reason, stick out more in the bush for me and are more striking. Now that little baby's gonna come out now. They almost double in size in their first year, and it's the first year that is the most dangerous for young giraffe. Probably move into the open there now, we can just shift over just a little bit to the right hand side to get a view of him or her. Lion, hyena and leopard are all predators of giraffe at this particular age and it's very rare to actually see um, young giraffe. You see a lot of baby giraffe but it's quite rare to see a young giraffe um, at this age. <coughs> and because they get big so quick, you literally are looking at a baby giraffe one day and the next time you see that giraffe it's already standing, you know, 9, 12 feet tall. It looks like a slightly older calf. It's not the giraffe you're looking at there eating the bushes is not the mother. I don't think of this youngster. She might be actually. It's so difficult. We're standing a little bit further away. I'll retract that statement. I think it probably is the mother of this calf. Busy nibbling on the top end of an acacia. There goes the baby, coming out into the open. <coughs> that youngster is probably standing about eight feet, nine feet above the ground. To give an example, if I were to stand with my arms fully outstretched on top of my head, that's about as big as that little baby is. And that little baby is literally just a year old. Can you believe it? All still legs and neck. Mark has made a comment that giraffe are a type of antelope and you're not far wrong there Mark, um, you're absolutely right. They are a type of antelope, antelope are like deer and antelope is a common name for um, a collection of animals that share certain similar characteristics or body shapes, very similar to your deer. Um, in the US, I'm, I'm gathering that you're from the US Mark, I didn't, I didn't get where you're from. Um, but yes, they are a type of antelope, they are ruminants, they are cloven hoofed animals, they share a lot of similarities in their digestive system and their diet to things like kudu, um, for instance. There's only, as far as I know, let me just think carefully here, there's only one other um, close relative or cousin to the giraffe and that is the ukapi which is a giraffe-like animal that was only really described to science in, I think, the 1960s. It was one of the last big, one of the last massive mammals that was described to science very recently. They live in very isolated pockets.